In ancient times before the existence of My Hero Academia, Studio Bone sub Studio C were tasked with animating the fun, wacky, and slightly perverted world of Soul Eater. And who'd be on top of that task? Well, that'd be this guy, Takuyu Igarashi. And under him was a beefy team, from the storyboard artists to the animators. There was no short supply of experience and that showed. The action scenes featured interesting choreography, loose movement and excellent camera work. However, there is one specific animator who brought all that and more, and that is the legendary Yutaka Nakamura. Now of course, anime isn't a one-man show or, or even a one-studio show. Flick through any credit list and you'll see a bunch of different names and studios and Especially if your production's melting, you'll find a lot more of them. However, when having one of the most influential action animators in the industry on your show, certainly not a privilege every adaptation gets, and also someone who, of no coincidence, had a hand in producing a good chunk of the best animation on Soul Eater, and also has the second highest key animation count. Therefore, it would be the injustice to not talk about the work of Yutaka Nakamura. Now jumping into the world of animation all the way back in the late 80s with the one anime that could rival the whole Dragon Ball has in Latin America, of course Saint Seiya, and since then participating on some of the biggest action series of the 90s like that Cowboy Show and Ava and a lot of other ones you've probably heard of and some you haven't. But by the time of Soul Eater, Nakamura more than had the experience in action and he definitely knew what went into making a quality scene. And right from the get-go, this man was going all out. The fight between Marker and the Kishin in episode 1 easily stands as some of his top work on the show. It was the clip that actually sold me on Soul Eater. Each movement is just very well thought out and detailed. And while Marker's animation is what's tempting to focus on, the fight wouldn't be nearly as cool if it wasn't for the Kishin. There's a great sense of spontaneity to the movement of this really messed up looking dude. Day in the life of a true From the first cut, the arcs for his movement are erratic, and when he leaps in the air, Nakamura breaks the joints to give an uncomfortable looking pose. Then when Marker approaches him, he darts back at a quick pace, then suddenly leaps up to the side of a building. This unpredictability to his actions, the fast pace to them, and the strength of his attacks give a really energetic feel to the combat. Again, the coolness of the action isn't just from how Marker's animated, but it's more so from how her opponent is presented, but it more so comes from the danger the opponent brings. If the Kishin, for example, was slow and attacked in a linear pattern, it wouldn't be half as interesting. Now, even despite Nakamura's roots and realism, around this time he begins experimenting, begins mixing in a more flashy look to his action, and with that brought out one of his most recognized and most replicated features besides cubic debris, and that is his use of the impact frame. Now, seeing a bunch of sketchy black and white frames for split second bursts, it's pretty normal in current action animation. However, before Soul Eater, no one did it. Well, not like this. Now, you've probably seen this little animation trick before if you're raised watching funny cartoon where animals brutally turn on each other and attempt to commit murder with homemade explosives. However, this was more so used for comedy and hid the action. But in Japan, there was one animator by the name of Yoshinori Kanada, one of the few people who rival Nakamura in influence, decided to change things up, made them black and white, and used them to emphasize an action or explosion, like in the example on screen. Definitely clever, and a lot of people began doing it. But Nakamura was going to rework it again. The first case is in episode 15 for this morphing sequence. Rather than a few still frames, like when one character is kicking another in the head, they're instead animated. And rather than using simple, flat shapes, it's flowy lines with a soft brush used for coloring. A very unique approach in both drawing style and use. Then a few episodes later, you see something similar again in this incredible scene. Although these are not impact frames. Now you might be thinking, how are these not? Well, in drawing style, they of course are similar, but just because a drawing is abstracted to a simplified form doesn't equal impact frame. It's how they're used within the scene. And here, well, rather than a quick burst between an action, this is a continuous abstraction that solely covers a character and, well, everything. Anyways, impact frame or not, it's just another feature that would play into the more flashy and cinematic type action his work was gradually moving to. And well, action animation down the road and anime as a whole. But something else that played into that was speed. Not that type, this sort of speed. It was distinctive and there was few that could come close to portraying it like Nakamura. An example is when this unfortunate fellow comes up against Death the Kid and gets spin kicked into oblivion. Like much of Nakamura's work, whether 90s or 2000s, it relies on high frame rates sitting on 1s and 2s. 
but it's the addition of background animation which then transitions to brush strokes, sort of like before, abstracting everything. Then finally, with each drawing space a good distance from each other, it combines all together and giving that fluid type of speed characteristic of Nakamura. Sounds kinda simple when laid out like that, but trust me in practice, there are a few of his followers which pull it off like he does. And besides that, it's also kinda interesting to look back to his train scene on Cowboy Bebop and just see the difference in approach. But outside of the technical stuff, it made those big moments like Marker taking on Ashura really exciting and, and memorable. And it also made for a really cool opening sequence. To put it simply, Soul Leader would not have been the same without Nakamura. Even the industry in many ways. And I'm not just saying that because of his action animation. The Kishin's Awakening, a, a scene almost as horrifying as this, the revival of this terrifying villain that the show had been building up for episodes, was given to the man himself. And what Nakamura brought was a grotesque and intense depiction. The fingers scratching the floor, the shaking of the head as it struggles forward, and the complex shading defining the rib cage and spine, as well as the design to it really giving texture to the skin. And is proof that Nakamura's skills definitely were not just limited to action. But then again, anyone familiar with his history knows he excels at animating this sort of stuff. Overall, Soul Eater was a special time. It sits as a stylistic bridge between his old and modern work and and with that just adds to the uniqueness of Soul Eater's animation. As I said earlier though, animation ain't a one-man show, and there's no better time to bring up another important name, Norimitsu Suzuki. Now it might be tempting to overlook Mr. Suzuki, considering he was pretty busy with the ending, so he animated on a whopping three episodes. Not a lot, but taking into account he was there from the first episode and produced a phenomenal scene at that, as well as creating the first ending, when it came to defining the style of action Soul Eater would go towards, no doubt he played a big role as well. And with that, there were certainly similarities between his and Nakamura's work, like Marcus spinning the scythe during the action, or characters leaping and flipping into attacks. And while that definitely added to the difficulty and time from a technical aspect, which the latter is often in short supply of for TV anime, it was a stylish and lively way to approach action with. And from the first episode onward, which of course Suzuki and Nakamura were heavily involved in, it would be consistently there for the rest of the series. Now, of course, I do not have the privilege of having interviews from every action animator and storyboarder on the show, so it is a little hard to give an exact answer as to the full extent of the influence Suzuki and Nakamura's style of action had on everyone. But just taking into account the inspiration those outside of Studio Bones took, such as Yoshimichi Kamada from AIC at the time, and funny enough would actually become a big name on Bones' next big title, Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, in his own words, wanted to challenge the work he had seen Nakamura do on Soul Eater. And so no doubt the staff at Bones, who would be literally sitting in the same room as these guys, would be paying attention to what these two were cooking up. And so while Nakamura may take the spotlight whenever discussions of Soul Eater's animation bubble up on the interweb, make no mistake, the contributions by Suzuki were important in their own right. And insanely good. But outside having Bones providing a strong team of animators, thanks to the power of connections, Soul Eater had big names from all over the industry dropping by, such as Masahiro Sato bringing his loose and dynamic action to episode 13, Katsunori Shibata in episode 49 animating complex background animation, then Hirofumi Suzuki, one of the biggest names from that famous ninja show, dropping in for episode 8, then episode 34, which brought a bunch of young talent and with that a wide array of styles, like Kanada school animator Masakazu Sunagawa, who animates stuff like this. And Yoshimichi Kamada, known for Full Metal, One Punch Man, and his heavy involvement on the show with that Give It The Bowl cut, which also recently finished and I am very sad about. Then there was the web gen crew with Kenichi Kutsuna, and also with one of the most prolific names from that movement, the man Shingo Yamashita himself, and who in time would be well known for his beautiful openings like in Jujutsu Kaisen and Chainsaw Man, and also the pain fight, which people are still arguing over to this day. But even if you have no clue who those names were, trust me when I say they were the best of the best. Now, at this point, I've laid out who the top animators were and what they brought. But the final piece of the puzzle, which I'll touch on briefly because time is of the essence and the majority of people have probably already clicked off the video. As good as your animators are, if you've got a boring storyboard, it can sort of work against them. But Soul Eater was blessed again. Because almost every storyboard artist on this show had either been around since the 80s or 90s and had a heap of experience in this position and over a wide variety of shows, especially guys like Ishihira, Fukuda, Masui, Igarashi, and Okamaru. But one element, one feature that caught my eye over and over again 
was the inclusion of these crazy shots. In a lot of them, the camera sits low using a curvilinear perspective. It's a very dynamic way to frame combat and also really hard to draw, but lo looks great when done right. Now again, I don't have any exact quotes, but Igarashi definitely played a part, because going back to his storyboard in episode 1 and especially 4, these types of angles are just everywhere and of course being the show's director, he naturally has a lot of sway to which direction the visual should go. Now I'm unsure if he sat everyone down and was like, yo I want some dynamic boards or whether this creative choice came through his own corrections or additions to the boards of those under him, regardless his influence came through and is just another one of Soul Eater's visual strengths. In summary, with an experienced team behind an equally experienced and talented director, Soul Eater at the time was putting out some of the best action you could find in Shonen, and is still just as enjoyable to this day. Of course, like many Shonen though, it's animation outside of action, your average conversation would be incredibly minimal in movement. Although you might get the occasional exception when a director or animator wants to drive home a special moment to the audience. Or you think it will enhance the appeal of a gag. Either way, character acting wasn't exactly at the forefront, but when it was included, it was done well and, and when there wasn't really much animation, you would be bound to get some expressive and fun manga-like deformation thrown in. But with that concludes why Soul Eater's animation looked so good. So thanks everyone for watching and check out our sponsor Fandom Eon for some insanely hard anime merch, a lot of shows and you can use the code RELICS for a 10% discount. And a special shout out to the new patron, Sol Binku in the High Roller class. But with that, thank you for watching. Maybe like the video or, or whatever if you enjoyed it. Um, if you didn't, um, don't. Although if you watched to this point, you probably did. At least I hope. 